and show them what we're talking about tonight. See, last weekend on Sunday was what? The day of Pentecost. And what is Pentecost known for? Speaking in tongues. That's only by people who don't actually know what the scripture says. And because our video about Pentecost has got so many views on it already, there's lots of comments and people debating whether or not they spoke gibberish or if they spoke actual languages. And this has presented a lot of confusion. Let's start with our Paleo Hebrew. We're going to get right into some tongues off the top, but it's not going to be gibberish. Show them my word for today. This is the word confusion. Now, up there in the right corner, this is located in Psalms 35, verse 4. The word is confusion. It is kapar. ka pa ra kapar. All right, go ahead and show them what the possible meanings could be for this word confusion. Let us learn our Hebrew. This first one, what is it? It's a fence, a wall. It means to separate or to divide. The second one is a picture of a mouth. It means to speak. It could be a word, an opening, or mouth. This third one is the picture of a man's head. It's a person, the head. It also means the highest, and it means first. Okay, so what do we got here? Let's see if we can uh, translate this tongue. Uh, go ahead and show me some options real quick. This is what I came up with. I picked, what is that? Oh, that's pretty good. Now, what is the word? It's confusion. Go ahead and show them the simple revelation of this word. To separate by speaking a word to a person. That's what confusion is. Because if I'm on the right path and you tell me the wrong thing, what do I become? Confused. So now the thing, the word that I hear can separate me from my purpose and what I'm believing. That's what confusion is when you're off the path. You've been separated. Okay, so let's dive right in. We got to do a very quick review of Acts chapter 2 before we get into the definitive breakdown regarding Lashwan. What is Lashwan? Who remembers? Lashwan? Remember, just a couple weeks ago, we did a message called Ah, Lashwan is tongue. That's right. Lashwan, right? Kodash. The Holy Tongue. Give me Acts chapter 2 and let's begin at verse 5. We're just going to review this so that everyone is absolutely clear about what was spoken on the 50th day. Now, it says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Give me verse 6. Scripture says, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man, what's that next word? Heard them. Who's the them? The apostles. Every man that was there heard them speak in his own language. Is that very clear? Okay. Give me verse seven. It says, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? What does that mean? All the men that are talking are from this place right here. We've seen them grow up. Not a single one of them went off to college to learn how to speak Spanish or German or any other language. Nobody there should have known how to speak Arabian. Okay. Give me verse eight. And they say. And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. So the word tongue here, what does it mean? What's another word for tongue? Language. language. How do we hear every man speaking our own language? Are they saying that the name of their language is tongues? No, no they are not saying that. So where did we get this idea that there is a language called tongues? And where in the world do they speak that? Okay, but let's keep going. Let's find out what languages they were actually speaking. Give me verse nine. <clears throat> the scripture says Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia. Give me verse 10. It says Phrygia and Pamphylia. 
in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. One more verse. It says, Cretes and Arabians, we, who is the we? He just listed off 18 different nations where the people had come from for the Feast of Weeks. Now, I need you to understand that this was not actually called the Day of Pentecost. It, in the scriptures, it is always referred to as the Feast of Weeks. Even when they showed up to it, they weren't showing up for Pentecost. They were showing up for the Feast of Weeks. What took place on the Feast of Weeks is men from all different nations came to Jerusalem and the disciples were filled with the Holy Ghost. And men from 18 different nations said, we hear them speak in our tongues. What is that? Languages, the wonderful works of God. Okay, now watch this. When it says the wonderful works of God, where they sitting there scratching their head wondering what was being said? Nope. So what we have is a bunch of men and they're actually speaking to who? They're speaking to other men. Isn't that right? They're not just speaking out into the air. They're not speaking to God. They're not speaking to themselves. They're speaking to other men. Other men hear them and understand them. Isn't that right? Okay. How in the world, in all of the world, did that crystal clear picture get repainted as a bunch of men speaking in a language that nobody can understand? If the scripture says that we understood that they were speaking the wonderful works of God, that's called confusion. That's deception. Give me Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19. Now watch the scripture says the lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. So now let's think about this for a second. Um, when Yahweh Shai returns, are we going to be speaking in tongues? <laughs> Nobody's going to be doing that stuff. We're going to all be speaking in one language. Because what language does he speak? He speaks in Hebrew. And what are we going to speak? We're going to also speak in Hebrew. Well, will they be able to say to us at that moment, oh, you don't have the Holy Ghost because you're not speaking in tongues. They won't be able to say that in the presence of Yahweh Shai. And we know for a fact he's not going to be speaking in a made up language that no man can understand. Give me Romans chapter 3. Verse 13, because people will offend you by saying, if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Christianity, they actually believe that and they judge you as someone who does not have the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in a language that they couldn't understand if you were speaking in it anyway. <laughs> Romans chapter three, verse 13, it says their throat is an open sepulcher. What is a sepulcher? It's a tomb. It's a mausoleum. It's a grave. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. What's an asp? It's a snake and a snake kills with his mouth. Because here's the problem. These people say they can both speak it and they can interpret it. Now, the scripture is very clear about the use of tongues and it makes a clear distinction. Let me prep you guys with the distinction. There's a such thing as with tongues. Whenever the Bible says with tongues, you know what that is? That's a real language. When the Bible says in tongues, it puts a word between the in and the tongue. What is it? Unknown. What is that? That is in unknown language that no man can understand. Now we're going to read some scriptures so that we can see the rules because this was an issue of counterfeiting in the time of Paul. The same way it is now. People would try to counterfeit the spirit. They would just start mumbling stuff and say, well, I'm speaking in the unknown tongue. And I would be like, no, you're not. You speak in gibberish. And they would say, well, you don't understand it because you don't have the Holy Ghost. <laughs> they said that during the time of Paul and they still say that today. But today we're going to find out. Give me first Corinthians chapter 14 and let's begin at verse one. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse one. Now pay attention. It says, follow after charity. What are you supposed to be chasing after? Charity. Well, what is charity? The action that love produces. You're supposed to be chasing after the opportunity to do something to demonstrate your love. 
Scripture says, and desire spiritual gifts. Somebody name a spiritual gift. Nobody? Teaching? Teaching? Well, that's good. Singing. Not singing. What you say? Not singing. Singing is not listed as one of the spiritual. To speak with tongues is a spiritual gift. And to interpret that tongue is also a spiritual gift. And he says, what should I be desiring? I should desire spiritual gifts. But, <laughs> but rather that ye may prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? To speak the testimony of Jesus is to prophesy. See right down there, it says, does it still, it still, still says it? Man, the answer is right there. Worship Yahweh for the testimony of Yahweh Shai is the spirit of prophecy. So what does he say that he would rather you do? prophesy why because if you prophesy if you tell someone the testimony of christ they can come into a relationship with him now give me verse two watch how these words are being used the scripture says for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men <laughs> wait a minute well who are you talking to then <laughs> you speaking in an unknown tongue it says, but unto God, who's the only person in the whole world that can understand what he's saying? God is. Why? Because he's, he's not speaking anything. So if he was giving the testimony of Christ to a room full of people, would any of the people understand? Absolutely not. Only God knows what this guy's talking about because he's speaking in an unknown tongue. The scripture says, for all men, no man understandeth him. That needs to just be crystal clear. When you hear somebody speaking, nobody understands what he's saying. If it was not true, the Bible would not say that. It says, for no man understandeth him, Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Does that sound like a good thing? Some people think that's a good thing. Would it be a good thing if I was trying to carry on a conversation with you and you didn't understand a single word I was saying? That don't sound like you was just scratching your head. You're like, it's a mystery. I don't know. Maybe he wants ice cream. Maybe he needs to use the restroom. I don't know. I can't help him because I don't understand him. That's never a good thing for someone not to be able to communicate with you. Now, give me verse three. That scripture said nobody understands him, right? But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. Okay, now when the disciples stood up and they began to speak in those different languages, what were they doing? What were they talking about? They were sharing the testimony of Yahweh Shai. And everybody, 3,000 men heard them in their own language. They were edified and they were able to come into the body of Christ. Why? Because they spake in tongues? No, because they spake with tongues for the purpose of edification. But he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Well, where's that comfort come from? From the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comforts you. Okay, that's going to be real hard for you to be comforted if you don't know what's being said. Give me verse four. Scripture says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Who does he edify? He edifies himself. But how does he edify himself if he himself doesn't know what he's saying? The only edification that's happening is he is building up his appearance of being holy. He looks real holy like he's having a communication that only he is tapped into. You don't know what was just said to me. You don't know what was just said to you. <laughs> right? Because no man knows. Now watch this. It says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now you got to say, am I selfish and am I only trying to build up myself or do I want to build up the body of Christ? Give me verse five. Now look at Paul's instruction. He says, I would that ye all spake. What does it say? With. He don't want nobody to speak in tongues. He wants you to speak with tongues. He says, I wish all of y'all could speak with different languages, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Now he says with tongues. So even if I have the ability to speak a different language, which one is greater? That I speak in actual different language or that I prophesy? 
it's better to prophesy than it is even to speak with tongues. So he's, he's trying to show you the difference between speaking in a real language and speaking gibberish. And he's saying gibberish, let's just discount that because nobody understands it. But if you actually have the ability to speak with a different language to people, it's still greater that you prophesy. Man, so how come nobody runs around here saying, oh, do you prophesy? Because prophesy is evidence of the Holy Spirit. You clearly have the Holy Ghost if you're able to prophesy. He says, greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he interpret. What does that mean? Okay, if I start speaking in a different language, Yahweh Ba'ashem, Yahweh Shai Barakatham, what do I need to be able to do if you don't understand what's been said? I need to be able to interpret it. So what do I say? The Most High, that's Yahweh. Bahashem, in the name, Yahweh Shai, that's the Christ. Bless you. Well, bless you too. Now that I have interpreted, that is even greater than if I prophesied because I spoke with a tongue and I interpreted that tongue. Why? The scripture says that the church may receive edifying. If I just come up here and I'm just rattling off mad Hebrew words and all kinds of stuff. And you guys are like, yeah, that man, he's getting pumped up. Ooh, he's sweating and everything. I don't know what he said, though. <laughs> he likes to hear the sound of his own voice. Give me the next verse. Watch this. It says, now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what is Paul speaking? Anybody pick a language? Pick one. Spanish. Paul said, if I come unto you and I'm speaking Spanish, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. So what is he, he pointed out? Three, four, brother man for no, he, he, he pointed out four different ways that you can benefit somebody. What are they? Revelation. Yep. You, you tell them what the most high has revealed to you or knowledge. knowledge. That means your personal experience. I saw, I heard, and I experienced. Go ahead. By prophesying, I'm telling you the testimony of Yahweh Shai. Really giving you precepts. Is there anything that he left out? So that he says, if I come to you and I hit you with those things, that's powerful. Okay, now watch this, verse seven. And then he says, and even things without life giving sound. Name something that's not alive that gives sound. A drum. Okay, now watch this. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped? or harped. If I hit this drum and it goes wow 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 wow, nobody's going to dance to the beat, right? I'm playing a beat and like wow 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 wow, it's not it's not going to work unless you understand the sound that is coming out of every single thing. You are not going to do what you're supposed to do when you hear the sound. Does that make sense? Okay, now if I'm speaking to you and I'm telling you to repent because Yahweh Shai is returning but you don't understand what I'm saying, are you going to repent? Nope, you will not be ready. Now watch what he says right here. Give me verse eight. He says, for if the trumpet, how's the trumpet sound? That's beautiful. Y'all know. Do, 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 do. That's, that's when, okay, watch. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, you put it up to your lips and it goes. What in the world? What kind of shofar do you have? Your shofar beatboxes? If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? If it's time for me to give you a warning and I put the shofar to my mouth and I blow it and you don't understand the sound that comes out, are you going to know that we're under attack? Absolutely not. He is taking simple everyday items and objects that we deal with on a regular basis and explaining that thing has a sound and you understand the sound that it has. Okay, now watch this. Give me the next verse, verse 9. The scripture says, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. What do my words need to be? How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. 
Isn't that right? Because no man understands me. Only God understands me. I don't even understand what I'm saying to God. I'm rattling off in some language that I have no idea what I'm saying. I could be cursing him. I could, couldn't I? Now, what will they tell you? No, there's no way that I'm doing that. You don't know. You don't know what you're saying to him. Give me the next verse. No, no, watch this. Let's jump down. When you guys have more time, read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The whole chapter is dedicated to this issue. Jump down to verse 13. Watch this. It says, wherefore, let him that speaketh. We're back to this. How's he speaking? In an unknown tongue. Well, what does this dude need to do? Pray that he may interpret. <laughs> Why does he need to pray? Because what did it say before? No man understands him. So you need to pray that somebody is going to understand you because nobody does. Okay, give me the next verse. Now, Paul says, well, what about me? For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, because my spirit just communicates straight with the Father, right? But my understanding is unfruitful. Does that sound like a good thing to be unfruitful? That's, that's not a good thing. So people would be like, oh, well, I'm praying in the spirit and they'll start mumbling off some random words that don't mean anything. And they'll say, it's OK, it's not for you. I'm talking to God. But you don't know what you're saying. Your understanding is unfruitful. Your spirit. Yep. Your spirit is praying. God is reading your mind regardless of any words that are coming out of your mouth. But your understanding is not producing fruit. Give me the next verse. Verse 15. Now, look at Paul. He's starting to get a little upset. He's like, what is it then? <laughs> That's how I'd be feeling with some of these people. I'd be like, look, the scripture clearly says they were speaking languages. What? You don't get it? You can't see it? What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. How am I going to pray? What's the spirit? What's the spirit? Give me John chapter 6, verse 63. Pray, I'm going to pray with the spirit. Okay. Well, do I just make up anything? I just make unintelligible noises and say that that's the spirit? No. He's being very specific. John chapter 6, verse 63, we find out what the spirit is. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. What is the spirit? So when I pray, what am I supposed to use when I pray? The words. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now take me back. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. Paul says, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit. What am I using when I pray? The word you, you really think you're going to come up with some words to talk to the father that are better than the words that the son of God himself came up with. He literally said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And he gave you a whole list. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You guys know how it goes. That's better than anything I can think of. It literally covers everything that I should be praying about. So when I pray, I pray with the spirit. But look at Paul, he says, and I will pray with the understanding also. Now that he said that, is Paul praying in the spirit by using an unknown language? No, because he says he prays with the understanding also. He says, I will sing with the spirit. What words am I singing? You think you're going to come up with some better words than what David came up with? You ain't going to You guys know that song, The Blessing? That's one of the most popular Christian songs of all time, isn't it? Huge. They didn't write those lyrics. You know what made it so good? David wrote those lyrics. You're not going to come up with no lyrics better than what David came up with. He is literally the psalmist. He's a king, but he's also a songwriter. So he says, I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Okay, now if I start singing in an unknown tongue, do I know what I'm saying? I don't even know who I'm saying it to. Give me this next verse right here. Verse 16, the scripture says, Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit. Barakata. Okay, I just blessed you with the word. How shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, 
Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Now, if you guys had never heard me say Barakatha before and I said that, you'd be like, what? <laughs> what you say about my mama? <laughs> right? But because you know what I am saying, because we've said it so much, you're able to respond and say it back to me or say amen. That's what he's saying there. Give me verse 17. Barakatha, sneezing up in here. Ah, I am the bar. For thou verily givest thanks. Well, what'd you do? Man, you was praying up a storm, but the other is not edified. He don't know what you're doing. You praying and he doesn't know what you're doing. How's he supposed to say amen? What does amen mean? So be it. How's he supposed to agree with and add power to this prayer if he doesn't even know that you're praying? Give me the next verse, verse 18. I told you this whole chapter is about this. Now watch, Paul says, I thank my God. I speak, what does he do? I speak with more tongues than ye all. What does that mean? Well, I just happened to be Paul. Christ happened to talk to me. And when he talked to me, he talked to me in a certain tongue. The scripture says he spoke to me in. So I understand Hebrew, but he made me the apostle to the Gentiles. And these Gentiles, what language do they speak? They speak Greek. Some of them speak Arabic. Some of them speak German. They speak all these different languages. And he told me to go out and preach to all of them. So what gift do I need in order to do that? I need the gift of speaking with tongues. See, but I didn't go to school, right? I didn't go to school. I haven't learned German. I haven't learned Chinese. I haven't learned any of this. When it's time for me to give the message, I pray for the Holy Spirit. And it gives me the ability to speak it in the language that they understand. Now, that is a gift. That is a real gift, isn't it? I don't know very many people with that gift. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I don't know nobody demonstrating that gift out here these days. I don't see that. I see people counterfeiting that gift. People counterfeiting it so that they look holy, but nobody else in the room is edified. He says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. I speak with more languages than anybody you know, is what he says. Now watch, give me verse 19. Look at what it says, you got to see it. It says, yet in the church, where is he at? Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding. That by my voice, I might teach others also. Then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Wow. All that gibberish and mumbling and babble that you're doing is just confusing. It looks real holy. You can speak 10,000 words. And I can just speak five words. And you will be more edified by these five than those 10,000. How much weight do they put on this idea of speaking in tongues? Maybe they never read the scriptures. I would rather speak just five words. Jump down to verse 22 for me real quick. Now look here. It says, wherefore tongues are for a sign. What are tongues for? Okay. You guys got to see this because who requires a sign? The Jews require a sign. So tongues are for a sign. Now look, it says, not to them that believe. <laughs> Wait a minute, if you already believe that Christ is the Messiah, should I be speaking in tongues to you? No, because you already believe, and tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but to who? But to them that believe not. Okay, let's put this into practical application. See, we all believe in here, but if somebody came walking in through the door and they spoke a different language other than English, and they were like, what are you guys doing in here on a Friday night? I hear the music, but ain't nobody dancing. Is this a club? What are we going to do? Somebody would need to be able to speak so that that person could be edified. Isn't that right? Now, let's say that I decide to speak, but what language do they speak? Let's pick, let's pick a random language. Go. Russian, they come in and they speak Russian. And I don't speak no Russian at all. But I want you to imagine that Jemay just, she, she can speak a little Russian. So I talk and Jemay translates it. And that person hears the word in the language wherein they were born. Now, what would be the benefit of that? So that he could believe. 
Ki, speaking in any other language when everybody in this room speaks in English. There's no benefit in that. Okay? Jump down to verse 26. Now he's talking about in the church. He says, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together? He's pulling their card right now. He's like, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Wait a minute. Every one of you? What are you guys trying to do if every time you come up in the church, everybody got something different? You're just trying to show off. It's like, how is it that every time you guys come together, somebody wants to show off and pretend to be spiritual? Oh, I got this psalm. I got that new doctrine. I got this tongue that I can speak in. I got this revelation. I got the interpretation. The scripture says, let all things be done. How? Let all things be done unto edifying. I don't care what gift you think you have. If it does not edify the body, it's not a gift. It's just you being puffed up, right? Man, puffed up. Give me this next verse. I'm wrapping it up now. It says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two. Why? So their stories can agree. Wait, so I'm talking in a language that nobody understands. The evidence that what I'm saying is true is somebody else would also be able to say the same thing. Now our two stories agree, but we still need somebody to do one thing. Somebody got to interpret it. If I start, I start doing all of that. Simon need to stand up and start saying the same thing that I just said. Go. See, it's not going to happen. Okay, now watch this. And after both of us have done that, in the mouth of two, that third witness needs to stand up and say, yep, I exactly heard what he said. He's about to give me his whole wallet and the keys to his house. Because I'm going to quickly be like, that's not what I said. Is that what you said? I don't know what I said. I don't know what you said. This person got the, the scripture says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. And that by course, that means one after the other and let one do what? Okay. Now watch this rule. This is a hard and fast rule. Give me verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. So every time somebody speaks in an unknown tongue, what needs to take place? Somebody needs to interpret. And if nobody is going to interpret it, like somebody stands up, right? And they're talking about, they, they coming in a Honda, but they should have bought me Mitsubishi. Okay. They're, they're, they're talking, they're talking real slick and real fast and nobody is able to interpret it. That person should not pretend to say, so be like, oh, oh, wait, we didn't understand the last thing that you said. You're not about to talk again up in here because there was no interpreter. The scripture says you need to keep silent in the church. And let him speak to himself. Now watch this. But does he understand what he's saying? No, nope, but he's still speaking to himself and to God. Now God understands what he's saying. See, but what he's saying is, most high, I'm very prideful. And I'm going to use you to demonstrate how prideful I am. That's all he's saying. All right. Jump down some more. I wish we had more time up in here. Give me verse 33. Watch this. For God is not the author of what? Say it in Hebrew. Say it in Hebrew. What was the word? You guys learned the word at the beginning of this service. Kapar. Oh, kapar. Now, if I had just said it and you guys had not seen it at the beginning of this message, you would have been like, what is he talking about? Because I would be speaking with a tongue that you're not familiar with. You would have been kapard. <laughs> Conf you'd be confused. Does that make sense? But because we started off and you know that the word kapar means confusion. You also know that Yahweh is not the author of confusion. Well, what is he the author of? But of peace as in all churches of the saints. Amen. Jump down one more time. My last selection and I'm wrapping it up. Give me verse 37. Now watch. He gives a warning at the end of this. He's like, because people are going to be prideful and you're not going to know if they really speak in a language or not. I don't know if you guys have ever heard somebody speak like uh, Swahili. 
right? You ever heard somebody like speak in a, like a deep African dialect? You don't know what they're saying at all. It could be in tongues. It could be a real language. You don't know. What? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Look, it says, if any man think himself to be a prophet, what does he think he is? Or spiritual. You know how those people are. You acting real spiritual right now. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He says, what I'm telling you, if somebody, anybody, anywhere disagrees with what is being said, let him acknowledge that what I said is the commandments. Amen. Verse 38. It says, but if any man be ignorant, what you do? Let him be ignorant. You show them every single scripture that there is no shred of evidence in the scriptures of people babbling in a made up language. And the Bible talks against it and it gives you rules if you think you are doing it and you don't want to follow none of that stuff. You just want to be ignorant to what the scripture says. What I'm supposed to do. Ignorant. You ignorant. I'm just going to let you be ignorant. <laughs> Right. Now give me verse 39. Now watch this. It says, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. Now, this, this form of covet is not the one that's against the commandments. This is to have a deep burning desire. Because how do you know that the Holy Spirit is using you? What is the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Man, hold on. Hallelujah. Just something just came to me real quick. This is that. Hold on. Let me see. I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Boom. Give me Joel chapter 2 verse 27. Because something is going to take place. This thing is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says exactly this. Joel chapter 2 verse 27 and 28. Oh, we're going to have to go into this for a minute. We're going to have to get into it. Look. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am Yahweh, your Allah, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. OK, where's he at? He's in the middle of us. Right now, look at what he's going to do when he's in the middle of us. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. What are they going to do? Because they have the spirit. Prophesying. Prophesying is evidence of the Holy Spirit. It says your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Give me verse 29. Now watch. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Very clearly, the Bible tells you if he pours his spirit on you, you're going to do something and it's not speak babble. What are you going to do? You're going to prophesy. Okay, now take me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39. 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Look at Paul's warning. He says, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. What is he saying? Have a burning desire to have the spirit poured out on you. And forbid not to speak with tongues. So if you start speaking in an actual language, I am not going to forbid that. But if you come up in here and you're trying to tie a bow tie, if you're coming in, a, you know, I'm going to forbid that. How's it going to work? You may not. I don't know what you're speaking. I'm going to ask you what you say. Because what are you supposed to do if you don't know what you said? You're supposed to pray that you can interpret. If you don't, and I ask you what you said, I'm going to stop you the next time you try to do it. Does that make sense? Give me this very last verse. Verse 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Amen. This is the message that we have for tonight. Hallelujah.